on, right? All right, thank you. At least part of the design question. Um, so let's go and look at this. Look at the problem that we were to design. All right, so in identifying the classes that we're going to create, because what we want to do is twofold. We want to come up with a, uh, a class diagram, and we want to come up with test cases. A lot of people forgot the test cases. So I'll talk about the test cases. Um, might as well talk about them now, all right, because I'll talk about them very quickly. An example of a test case would be that a person takes out a book and returns it 30 days late and the expected outcome is that they should have a how much fine they should have a regular book is 28 days so if they had it out for 30 days they should get a 50 cent fine so that would be a test case in other words a real world scenario that you're going to run through your code to see if it produces the output that the specifications describe. All right, so that would be one test case. Person takes out a book, re uh, regular book, returns it 30 days after the data was checked out, and they should get a 50 cent fine. Do they get a 50 cent fine? So that would be an example of a transaction that you'd want to process. Similar for the other things. So you'd, you'd do a new book and make sure that that was right. Take out uh, a material and turn it in on time. Do you get a fine or not? So those are what I mean by test cases. In other words, real life scenarios that are going to test every portion of your code. All right. There's a couple other uh, error conditions that we described here, like an item can't be checked out if a patron already has it. So. Um, check out a book and then try to have someone else check out the same book and you sh should not be allowed to. All right, so a test case for each one of those. Written in those terms, a description of the expected output and, a you know, and then compare that with what you get. The good thing about this is if you build a, test, a unit test class like this, you can keep that unit test class and if something ever changes, you can rerun your whole suite of tests again. That's one thing I've noticed and again, maybe people have been like, running their test case, then editing their test case, and running a new one, and editing it. Just copy and paste so you have all your test cases in that unit test. Because sometimes it looks like folks only tested one thing. And I'd hate to think that they did that. Uh, I hope, like in, the, in the, the tuition example, I hope that people tested more than just an in-county for 12 credit hours. All right? Because, yeah, that, you know, if you get that to work, that's good. But there's a lot of other things you need to test as well. For a more thorough discussion on what a test case can look like, you can look in this thingy. Test cases. Um, really, the test case in, in our situation would be I describe the scenario and the expected result. The test step you don't really need. The test step is all going to be that you're going to have code in your unit test to handle it. And the actual outcome, if you're doing like real, if you were actually doing the real life testing, you'd have an actual outcome and you'd, you'd test it and you'd note, note it, notate it. Now, depending on the organization that you're in, sometimes you will do your own testing. 
and sometimes there'll be a quality assurance department. So if there was a quality assurance department, they would write up the results, and then they would send them back to the program, and the program would have to figure out what went wrong and, and did it. If you yourself are the tester, you would just, you know, you wouldn't need to write the expected results. If it was something that you didn't expect, you'd go and fix it. All right, so don't forget about the test cases, because that's important too. Class diagram. <clears throat> when we look at this description on the page, as I mentioned, one of the things to do, a good starting point, I won't say it's the only thing to consider, but a good starting point is to read the scenario and look at nouns. All right? A library has patrons. All right? Um, in this case, I don't think we really need a class for library, because library is just sort of the container that contains all these classes. So you could probably create a class for library, but I wouldn't worry about it. But let's note the other classes that we have, or the other potential classes we have. We have patrons. We have materials. We have books. New books. DVDs and new DVDs. Now, and then I have a list of some of the attributes they have and some of the things that they have to, to, to do, have to say. Um, and we'll come along those in, in uh, a minute. And then here's the schedule for what the fines are and so forth. Now, the materials is where most of the fun takes place in this example, all right? Because that's really where you're going to be designing. The patron is just a patron. There is no inheritance between patron and anything else, right? A patron is not a library book. A patron is not a library materials. Library materials are not patrons. You can't have books borrowing other books, or you can't borrow a patron from the library. None of those things make sense, right? So therefore, there's no case of inheritance between the patrons. So the patron simply is going to be using those other classes. So that's sort of the relationship between patron and the rest of the world. The real interesting thing, though, gets to the relationship with the rest of the classes. All right, materials, books, new books, DVDs, and new DVDs. Now, I gave sort of a tip. And I said, use inheritance with this. Why use inheritance with this? Well, that's a chapter that we just went over, right? So I want you to practice using inheritance. But I think there's another reason, too. I think the argument can be made that is a better way to do it to do inheritance. If you weren't going to use inheritance, what would you do? If you weren't going to use inheritance, what could you do? Yes? Well, yeah, you could write brand new, you could write classes that didn't inherit from each other at all, and that would be, that would be really probably the worst case scenario. But you could do it, right? So you could have separate classes that don't inherit. What would be the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is there's a lot of similarity between a book and a new book, right? I mean, it has the same attributes. It has many of the same methods. Really, the only difference is, is how long you got the book and, um, what the fine is, all right? So you could do that, but you'd do a lot of extra work. You'd have set author, set title. You have all those things in multiple places. Same thing if you had DVDs. What's another way that you could do it? Could you do it with just one class for all library materials? Well, maybe different constructors. Bunch of if statements. So what you could do is you could have a library material type. So you could have a library material and then a library material type. And when you created a library material, you'd give it the library material type. You'd say, OK, this is this, and it has, it's a new book. 
or this is this and it's a, this is this library material and it's a, it's a regular DVD. What is wrong with that? Well, a couple things are wrong with that. First of all, in order to do that, I would have to have all the attributes that could be in any library material I would have to put in that one class. So certain things that don't really make sense, like a DVD has a rating. Books don't have ratings. Books don't have ratings that like they're PG or PG-13 or R or something like that. And yet, that attribute would have to be in that class, which means that through sloppy coding, I could code a book that I said was rated PG-13. And that doesn't make any sense, right? Because books don't, aren't rated that way. I don't know if they're rated anyway, but they're definitely not rated that way. All right? Likewise, I could have an author for a DVD, which really doesn't make sense. We, I don't have all these attributes, but I could have number of pages for a DVD. I could have special features for a book. I would have to put all those attributes in that one class and have a bunch of if statements to see when they were relevant, what to use them for, and so on. That gets to be a mess. And it's not very extensible either. It'd be a very fragile piece of software because anytime if the library got new materials in, you'd have to really change some complicated code, code that had a bunch of if statements and a bunch of properties. For example, my library started uh, carrying, well, they didn't start, but they've had for a while, but they, they have video games. So that would be a whole new class, a whole bunch of new if statements. Things that uh, don't make sense for books and DVD would be all in the same class. For example, is it an Xbox game or a Nintendo game or a uh, PlayStation game? So you have all those attributes crammed, and you could set those attributes for any sort of library material, and that really doesn't make sense. And the code would be complicated, and the code wouldn't be easy to expand. So it's probably better to use inheritance here. With inheritance, I'm not going to have a rating on a book, because there's no rating attribute for a book. There's a rating attribute for a DVD. All right. Uh, and the code is going to be very straightforward, because I don't have to consider all the possibilities. In the new book class, I just need to figure out how to calculate the fine for a new book. All right? And that's all I need to do. Um, besides, if you don't like my reasons, that's what the assignment calls for. All right? Yeah, I hate to do that. <laughs> You'd hate to come to that point, but, you know, because I said so is, is you know, a semi-valid reason in, in, in education. But I also think it's a better way to do it. So what are we going to have then? We're going to have which of these, how would you inherit these? Because you could probably do this a couple different ways. Really, a lot of this, there, you could do a couple different ways that would be effective. But what makes most sense? Yes? Books and DVDs inherit from materials. So materials is sort of the most generic thing that we have here, right? Uh, in other words, what are you all going to the library for? I'm going for materials. You know, what are you checking out? I'm checking out materials. That's very generic. That's not very specific, right? Now, would that typically be, do you think that would be an abstract class or a concrete class? An abstract class. Why? Because you don't go to the checkout and say, here's some material. You, get, you give them a book or you give them a DVD in this, in this scenario, all right? Um, so therefore, materials is at the top of the chain. Then we suggested book and DVD. All right? And that sounds reasonable. And that passes the is test. A book is a library material. Or, phrased differently, a book is an example of a library material. 
a DVD is an example of a library material. All right? So where do new books and new DVDs come in? You have two choices. All right? I'll draw them with dashed lines to indicate that this is a choice. New book could inherit from materials and new DVD could inherit from materials or new book could inherit from book and new DVD could inherit from DVD. Which one of those makes more sense? Okay. Okay. And why do you why do you say that? Right. In other words, look at it this way. There's certain things that all books share. And again, keep in mind that you at least have an eye on expanding this and maintaining it. You can drive yourself crazy thinking about all the possibilities that could change. All right? So you could go overboard with that. But it makes sense that there might be some more things that we would want in our library, like to keep track of the number of pages in a book, who the publisher is. I didn't include those because I just didn't want to have a lot of busy work making gets and sets, and it's not really relevant to the heart of this problem. But in an actual scenario, you can see things like that, number of pages. What kind of binding does it have? All those things are characteristics of books, all right? They're characteristics of books, and they're characteristics of new books. How does this work as far as the is test go? Is a new, a new book is a book? A new book is a kind of book? Sure. So it passes the is test. So to your point, point well taken, I would do it this way. I would have new book inherit from book. DVD, or new DVD rather, inherit from DVD. Put simply, there are things that all library materials have in common. There are things that all books have in common. There are things that are specific to new books. There are things that all library materials have in common. There's the things that all DVDs have in common. And there's some things that are specific to new book, new, new DVDs, rather. Would books, and, would books and DVDs be abstract or concrete classes? We said this is probably an abstract one. Would a book be, the way we have this drawn here, would a book be a concrete class or not, or abstract? Be concrete. Why do you say that? Oh. Um, that is partly true, but we could, we could still make book a concrete class, or I'm sorry, an abstract class. That would just push it down to the next one, would have to have, con would have, to have everything concrete. So these guys definitely got to be concrete, because there's no further down you can go, all right? The question I would ask is, is look at it from a real world perspective. Can I check out just a plain old regular book that's not a new book? Absolutely. So therefore, there are plain old regular books that exist in the real world, that are tangible. They're not new books, they're just regular books. So they are, they, it is a real thing, and I don't need to say anything more about it. It's just, it's a book that I'm checking out. Now there's special kinds of books, all right? And therefore I would make this concrete, and likewise the DVD I'd make concrete. Now, I don't want to confuse folks, but I could do this if I wanted to. Materials, 
book, regular book, new book. And then I could make this an abstract class. Because, well, it's not enough to say you're checking out a book. You have to say, am I checking out a regular book or a, a new book? All right, so I could do that. But the way this problem is, so if you did this, that's OK. All right? But this is also acceptable as well. Because it seems like the only thing we're interested in is it like a regular off-the-shelf book, or is it like a special new book? So it seems that that's the only thing that's relevant. One of the things that's important whenever you're doing this, and essentially what you're doing is you're creating a model of a business or a model of an organization, is you're going to model the stuff that's relevant. In truth, there really are all kinds of books in a library, right? There's picture books. There's oversized books. There are kids' books. There are reference books. There are um, graphic novels. There are fiction. There's nonfiction. The question is, is, is that relevant to the problem that we're trying to solve? And in this case, you might say, well, that's not really relevant. I didn't say there was anything special about checking out a sci-fi book. All right, so therefore, for this particular solution, I don't need to differentiate between those because those are not relevant. All right, that's the, yeah, those things exist, but it's not relevant to that. All right, if there ever was any special rules for sci-fi books, I don't know, maybe you got them for a longer period of time or whatever, you could then create another one. Um, off of that, another subclass. All right, so I think that is the classes that we want. It then comes down to the attributes and methods that we need. All right, remember this though. Uh, unlike the example that I posted, you really only need to indicate the attributes and methods that are unique to that class. So you don't, if something is defined in the superclass, you don't need to show it as being defined in the sub subclass. That's implied. So let's look at our thing, and let's so start drawing. I'll give myself more space, and I'll put in space for attributes and methods. So this is my materials. What do I say about all materials? All materials Oh, I actually, can, I actually can read between the line here. I'm, actually, I'm showing the screen. Books and DVDs both have an ID and a title. So guess what? That can be up in my materials. Date checked out. And patron checked out. There should be patron checked out for DVD, too. I forgot to put that in there. So those are both things that exist, both for the, pay, uh, for the uh, book, for all books and for all DVDs. Therefore, I can say all library materials. So, this is going to be the date checked out. And, and what? The patron. What types of these attributes going to be? ID is going to be what? Number or string. It doesn't really matter. I guess you define it the way you want. We'll say it's a number. 
or an integer or whatever. Title's going to be a string. Date checked out is going to be what? Local date time, or local date, actually. Because we don't care when it was checked out. If it's checked out today, it's checked out today. It doesn't matter if they checked it out first thing in the morning or right when the library closes. It's considered checked out today. All right, so time doesn't matter. And also, as we observed, that we can use get away with a local date time because time zones don't come into play here. All right, so therefore. Now, checked out by is going to be what data type? A patron, exactly. One thing that's hard for people or for some students to recognize is they think, well, I want the, I want the name of the person, so that'll be a string. No, you want the patron object that checked it out. That way, you can get anything that you want to about the patron. You could, write a, you could write code for every overdue book to generate an email that went to the email address for the patron, for example, if you have that patron object. If you have the patron name, you only have the name. If you have the object, you have anything that's associated with a, with a patron that's going to be available. OK. So remember, this is an abstract class. Um, all library materials should be returned to due date. So there should be get and sets for all of these attributes. Should return if it's overdue, is overdue. Going to return a Boolean. Gets and sets are going to return the appropriate things. Who has is checked out, or is it checked out? All right? You could actually write two functions. Is checked out? Who checked out? This would return a Boolean. This would return a patron. Oh, thank you. That would return a Boolean. That would return a patron. Find based on return date. So calculate fine, and you're going to give it the return date. And you're going to get back an amount. Now, we have to decide for each of these functions whether they are going to be abstract or concrete functions. Because remember, in an abstract class, you can still have some functions that are concrete. Are the gets and sets going to be concrete? Sure. We can set the attribute. Setting the title or the ID of the attribute, we can do that. We could write the code that does that. Likewise with the gets. So these are going to be concrete. Is checked out. Yeah, we can do that. We can look to see if the date checked out is not null. If it's not null, then it's checked out. Or we can check to see if the patron is null. If the patron is null, then it's not checked out. Who checked out? Yeah, that's concrete. Calculate fine. That's one that cannot be concrete because there's no default way to calculate the fine. All right? There's a way to calculate the fine for uh, each specific kind of thing, all right? So there's a way to calculate the fine for DVDs, for new DVDs, for books, and for new books. So this, there's no default way to do that. So this is going to be abstract, all right? We're going to ignore the patron, like I said. We'll talk about the patron very briefly at the end. OK, a good question. Would we need an abstract function for the due date? Um, 
it would be a good idea to have one, yes. Um, could we write it without having one? Probably, but it would be a good idea. Because you would need the due date to determine is it overdue and what the fine is. Both of those need the due date. So therefore, we need that calculated, all right? So a abstract function for getting due date would be a great thing to have, too. Maybe, well, we already said to calculate fine. We have an abstract function. I was going to throw that in. Now. What is going to be different? And we'll just do this for books and new books. We won't do the DVD part. What is different about a book and new book? What attributes do books have that the other ones don't have? Well, a book has an author, all right? So one of the attributes that a book needs is an author. That's not in library materials, all right, because DVDs don't have authors. Um, and um, that's it. What methods need to be implemented in the book? And this question is almost answered for us if we look at this diagram carefully, assuming, of course, you can read it. What methods do you know we got to implement in the concrete class? Exactly, the ones that are defined as abstract. So in the book class, we need a calculate find method, and we need a get due date method. All right. Is that all we need in the book class? Well, we need gets and sets for the author. All right. What about new book? What is different between a new book and a regular book? Exactly. The fine and the due date. So therefore, we're going to override. It's not going to be there's no and there's no new attributes in a new book, but there'll be an override for calculate fine and get due date. So again, if you see this, it's complicated in the sense that you have a lot of classes, but each one of these functions is going to be real simple. It's not going to be a dozen if statements that says if this and that and that and so on. It's just going to be very very straightforward to say, well, it's 25 cents a day if it is a regular book. And if it's a new book, there's another formula to calculate it. So each one's going to be very straightforward. Now, are these the only methods you need? Maybe, maybe not. You might find when you're writing this some additional methods. Remember that when you plan, this is a plan, this is a design. That doesn't mean that if you figure something out that makes your life easier, that you can't put it in. All right? It's kind of like the analogy I gave is like you're planning a car trip to Columbus, and you're going and you find out that there's uh, construction on one of the roads that you're going to take. Well, you don't stick to the plan just because you planned it that way. If your GPS says, hey, there's a faster route, take the faster route. You planned it, but in executing the plan, you found a better way to do it because of circumstances or whatever. Same idea here. All right? We can plan to do this, but we could add some other functions. Calculate, we could have a function to calculate how many days it's overdue. All right, that might be a function that we could put in somewhere. All right, uh, that might be useful in calculating the due date. There might be a function for um, show me how many days the person has this book for. And we might be able to reuse that code in a couple places, and that may make our life easier. But the idea is, is with your plan, you at least have an idea of how you're going to approach it, instead of just sort of um, you know, uh, flailing at the problem, hoping that you, you, you get success with it. One of the things you do, in fact, 
good programmers do, much like good writers do, is when you're done with it, you look at it and you see if anything can be improved. And that largely comes down to seeking out, um, seeking out um, duplicated code, seeking out code that you could streamline, and so on. All right? Questions about this? All right? So that's not the whole design, but that's the inheritance part of it. And that's the part, I think, that was throwing people. So if you didn't get full credit, you're welcome to redo it. I would do it as quick as you can. All right? Uh, if you haven't finished this, I would get it in as soon as possible. Uh, we've given you a good start on this. All right? And, uh, and that's all I have to say about this topic today. Any questions before I move on to topic number two of the day? Yes? Well, that would relate to that would relate to the persistence of data. All right. In other words, the one thing that we're not talking about in this class is where these things get stored, because all we're doing is we're creating the classes and we're creating the objects. All right. So we define an object as a new book. So um, you know, a new book comes in, we define it as a new book. Boom, we're ready to use it. All right. Uh, in reality. That would come one of two ways. Um, probably that would be stored in a database, that, and there would probably be a policy that is a new book for the first two months. And every two months, there would probably be a procedure that would run that would go and change that uh, and remove it. But for now, we don't really need to worry about it. We'll create it as a new book if it deserves to be created as a new book. That's more of a database procedural part of the system that we're not really getting into. That's a great question, though. Um, and it is something that, if you're doing a larger system design, um, something to consider. One thing to keep in mind, I've been talking about unit testing in terms of, of testing our classes and testing our programs and so on. Remember, when we talk about system testing, we are talking about everything in the system, not just the code and the hardware. We're talking about the procedures that are implemented and the data and all that. So that sort of thing about like, well, how, how does a book go from new book status to regular book status, that would probably be some procedure uh, that would exist within the organization. And you would want to test that to make sure that that procedure works correctly. Great, great question. All right, now on to the problem of multiple inheritance. All right? Because our is a rule can confuse us sometimes. All right? Because things are many. Any, anything that you talk about can actually fit into any number of categories. Right? A bird is an animal. A bird is also a thing with feathers. All right? What are other things with feathers? Pillows, down jackets, and so on. Those are things with feathers. Birds are also things that fly, right? Birds fly. What are some other things that fly? Well, pardon me? Planes, helicopters, kites, insects, Superman, all right? All those things are examples of things that fly. So if we're deciding to put, if we're deciding to create a, a subclass superclass relationship between two things, how do we do it given that something can fit in several categories? It's not a straightforward question. You might sort of laugh about that, right? Uh, because really, who is worried about, who is writing applications that deals with everything that contains feathers? Probably no one, right? So yes, while strictly speaking it is true, it's probably not going to be relevant in most cases to worry about the fact that birds and pillows and down jackets all contain feathers. All right? So that one kind of, yeah, it, 
is true, but we're not really interested. Now, the flying one, that could be, all right? Um, engineers that, that, that study airplanes, you know, bur you know um, planes flying into flocks of birds is dangerous, all right? And we might want to know something about things that fly for that reason, all right? So that's not beyond the realm of possibility that some engineer doing something with airplanes might want to consider other things that are flying around, all right? for whatever reason. So that's at least possible. So what do you do when something fits two isas and they're both relevant? All right. Well, you look for what I would call the stronger isa relationship. And oftentimes, it's the one that you would just common sense think of. All right. In other words, if someone were to come up with you and say, you know, what makes more sense to group things together? Birds, um, birds, uh, dogs, cats, um, fish, or helicopters, birds, planes, and kites. You'd say, well, birds, dogs, cats, and fish seem more closely related than those other ones. So in most of the cases, what sort of just seems reasonable, I would say the stronger is a relationship. But sometimes there are these other secondary relationships that are beneficial. And you can write code for them. All right? Let's consider something like this. An organization, like a college, we deal with a bunch of people. Right? We deal with a bunch of entities. We deal with students. We deal with faculty. Right? We deal with uh, staff. We deal with um, outside organizations, you know, corporations that have come to us for training or whatever. All right? So if we were going to draw a chart of the, the, the people or organizations that a college deals with, maybe it would look like this. And again, I'm picking a hypothetical college, not necessarily LC. But maybe it would look like this. That there are students. I don't know if I can. <laughs> I mean, I should be able to. Does... Oh, it's the thing on the top. These are the lights. I'm so dumb. There we go. Is that there? Thank you. OK. Students. And maybe we have undergrads, and we have graduate students. That makes sense for inheritance, right? Graduate students are students. Undergraduate students are students. OK? So that might make sense for um, an inheritance. Employees. And maybe their staff. And faculty. All right, makes sense, right? College has employees. Some of them are staff, some are faculty. Faculty are employees. Staff are employees. So that passes the is a test. Now, organizations that we do business with. Maybe we have vendors. Who are vendors? Vendors are people that we buy stuff from, right? So, you know, we might, um, you know, we might buy our cleaning service from a, a vending company or a, a vendor, or we might buy office supplies from someone, or we might buy stuff from 
who knows what, services, whatever. And we want to have customers. In other words, these are customers. These are organizations that have approached us for training. Now, and of course, vendors are organizations, customers are organizations. So all three of those inheritance schemes fall into place. Now, here's the question. There may be some behavior that crosses over all three of those little inheritance things where I can't make a superclass, but it would be nice if I could treat all of these things the same way for some particular function. All right? For example, remember back with our pizzas. All right? With our pizzas, we had regular pizzas and stuffed crust pizzas. But because, both, because stuffed crust pizzas were pizzas, we were able to treat them both the same way for many cases. We were able to put them both on orders. We were able to calculate the price of an order, whether it contained regular or stuffed crust pizza. We were able to determine the baking time, regardless of what pizzas were on the order. So it's nice to be able to treat things the same way. Now, we can treat all students the same way because there's a super class. We can treat all employees the same way because there's an employee super class. We can treat all organizations the same way because there's an organization super class. But there's no way for us to treat these things the same way, these three separate things the same way with what we've learned so far. I'll tell you what isn't a good idea to come up with some really kind of goofy class on this level and say, well, we're going to call this like a thing class, all right? And everything is part of the thing class. So we're going to get our common behavior, we're going to put in a thing class. That just sounds like one of them duct tape kind of solutions, right? One of those that isn't really a good solution for the problem that we're trying to solve, all right? So that's not an answer. What do all these things have in common? They're all contacts for the college. They're all people that we might want to make a phone call to, all right? Or send an email to, or send a letter to, all right? All things that we might want to do certain things for. So it would be nice if we could have multiple inheritance and say that these guys also were contacts, these guys were contacts, these guys were contacts, and so on. But remember, in Java you can't have multiple inheritance. You can only have one superclass. So, what do we have instead? We have a thing called an interface, all right? And interfaces do part of, give us part of the benefit of inheritance. So interfaces are almost as good as inheritance. With inheritance, we can inherit code, and we also get polymorphism, right? What is polymorphism? Well, polymorphism is the idea that, um, we can, we, can, we can treat different things the same way, and each one will respond in its own distinct way. So in other words, I could put all different kinds of pizzas on my order. When I ask for the price of each pizza, it's going to give me the price for that particular type of pizza. So if it's a stuffed crust, it'll give me a stuffed crust price. So what I can do is I can create an interface, all right? And that doesn't allow me to inherit code. So I don't get that benefit, but I do get the benefit of polymorphism. And that is I can treat all these things the same, and each will respond with the code specific for them. The way that you would draw an interface on a class diagram, so let's say we have our contact interface. You would draw it as a dashed line.
a class is said to implement an interface. So you extend a superclass, you implement an interface. Think of an interface like this, an abstract class that only has abstract methods. No attributes, no concrete methods. I realize it's a little vague. I wanted to set the groundwork for this, and next week we'll pick up on the actual coding for this. One thing to keep in mind, be careful of what you make a superclass subclass relationship. Why? Because you only got one. So be sure that it makes sense and you're really getting the benefit of it. Interfaces make as many as you want. A class can implement as many interfaces as you want. We'll just talk about what the rules are for implementing an interface next week. But if you have something implementing five interfaces, that's really no big deal. So you don't have to worry about creating a interface the fact that because of the fact that it can implement multiple interfaces. Whereas subclass, superclass, you should be pretty sure that it makes sense to do that because you only can do that in for one super for uh, each class could only have one superclass. All right. Um, that's it, I suppose. Sorry about the projector. I was thinking the wrong thing was the camera. I was thinking the light was. Uh, I guess I should look at it next time. Uh, and we'll see you in lab.